Hello students, welcome to the answer writing program. First of all, wish you a very, very happy new year and wish you a lots of learning, lots of good health, lots of success in this coming year. So as we are entering into 2024, let's discuss that what we have already done in the past four months. This answer writing program AWP has been started since September and in September we have covered GS2, uh, in October GS3, November GS4, then in December GS1 and we have done 249 questions starting from September to December. So this shows that how the small efforts like every day writing just three questions a day and being consistent for continuously four months, how this results into the 249 questions, approximately 13 full length tests you have already done. So you are out of the crowd. Most of the aspirants have not even started writing yet. So be consistent in the coming three months as well. I know that you are more focused towards the prelims as well. So for the next three months, what we are doing, we are taking only the prelims oriented or the prelims exclusive syllabus for our mains answer writing. Like we'll not deal with the society, social justice, uh, governance, world history, disaster management, internal security, but we will be doing the answer writing practice for the prelims exclusive topics. So that you will revise your syllabus for the prelims as well and continuously doing the answer writing practice also till March. So we will be covering GS2 in January, GS3 in February and GS1 in March. So be consistent with this answer writing. Just spare your 30 minutes every day, write it, all the three questions, put it on the portal, get it evaluated, self introspect, See this detailed discussion and improvise yourself. So let's start with the today's discussion. So in today's video, we will be dealing with GS2 polity and the topic would be preamble and schedule. So let's take an overview of all the three question. So the first question is dealing with preamble. The second question is related to absolute economic equality why it is not required, why it is not desirable and how to address the disparities. And the third question is related to anti-defection law, which is there in the 10th schedule. These both are of preamble. So let's start one by one. The very first question says that, do you think that preamble is merely a preface to the Indian constitution without any substantial significance? So what this question is saying that preamble is merely a preface without holding substantial significance. So merely a preface, it means it is just setting the context or setting the stage, what exactly is in the main book or the main constitution. So is it just setting the stage for the constitutional framework or for the constitution, what's, whatever written in the constitution? No, it is not like that. It holds a significant importance or it holds a substantial significance because it establishes the guiding principle, the fundamental purposes for the constitutional framework. So this way you can start the introduction by just saying that how preamble establishes the guiding principle and the fundamental purpose of the constitutional framework. You can write the introduction. You can also write some important dates that this preamble was adopted on 26th of November 1949 and it became effective from 26th January 1950. So this way you can start with the introduction. Next comes the body part. Now we have to tell that how preamble holds the significant importance. So for that we need to tell that preamble is not just a preface but it holds so much importance as it tells us that what is the source of authority for the constitution like it establishes so it establishes the people as the ultimate source of authority and in india we do it via our uh, elected representatives so finally we are the ultimate authority 
to govern our nation, to govern our state. Then it also tells about the nature of the state. It tells that India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. It means there is a re representation of the public is the head of the state. Then comes, it also tells about, it also throws the constitutional makers mind that what exactly what was in the mind of the constitutional makers like it reflects about their fundamental values and the philosophy of the constitutional makers it also preamble also tells us about that the constitutional makers wanted india to be the welfare state they wanted to focus on the justice fair and just uh, nature or behavior to everybody to the citizen of the people and that justice should be socially, politically and economically justice should be there. Then they wanted to establish the polity, the state, the nature of the polity that should be liberal. That is why there are the fundamental rights. So that is why they have written in the preamble that we want to establish the liberal polity where the people have the freedom of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship. Next comes, they wanted to establish the egalitarian society where they, everybody should hold or uphold the equality. Equality in what? Equality in status, equality of getting or accessing the opportunities. Next comes the culture. They wanted to promote the culture. They wanted to promote fraternity and unity. So everything, all these points are written directly in the preamble. So from the wordings of the preamble, we are telling that this is how preamble is holding the significance and you can also write that because preamble is holding this much significant that they tells us about all these things so that is why they are considered significant in the supreme court judgments as well like uh, supreme court decided or declared that preamble is a part or integral to the basic structure some of the philosophies of the preamble is the part of the basic structure and we cannot violate that. So it is not just a preface but it tells us about the fundamental values, the philosophy behind the constitution. And also Supreme Court tells us that when there will be any ambiguity or any uncertainty so this preamble will act as a guiding tool to show us the light that how to take the decision in that uncertainty. So this is the significance of the preamble. Ultimately, what you can uh, go towards the end that how this preamble holds the utility for the common man. Like anybody or everybody cannot just read directly the constitution. So the preamble is the gist. It shows the philosophy behind the constitution. So if we read preamble, we know about the basic nature or the characteristics or the philosophy in the Indian constitution as well. So it tells or it enables the understanding of the constitution, nature and the promises to the common man as well. So here you can quote some example that uh, one mosque in Shimoga district in Karnataka state tells or uh, says to the people that to read the preamble to understand what is the nature of the state, what the constitution says. So you can write this example as well. Okay. Finally, coming to the conclusion, so what we can write that it is beyond a preface as Pandit Dhakur Bhargav Das, an eminent constitutional uh, assembly and the constituent assembly member, he says that the, he said that the preamble is the soul of the constitution. So it means it is telling that it is not just a preface but a soul. Like it holds the fundamental theme of the constitution, the guiding light, the guiding principles, the basic characteristics and the nature and the promises that the constitution holds. It shows that behavior. So this is how we are finally concluding our first answer. Let's move on to the model answer. Model answer says something about preamble, its adoption date and effectiveness date. Then how it serves the different purposes and how it holds the importance finally by saying the Pandit Thakur Das Bhargav and how he says that uh, preamble is the soul of the constitution. So these pointers you can use in the introduction as well, you can use it in the conclusion but if you write these lines that uh, about these important point 
then you will fetch more marks in the mains and sometimes it can appear that who says what and the preamble is the soul of the constitution or DPSP is this fundamental rights or fundamental duties in prelims paper as well these types of question can come in. So be aware of these uh, facts remember this try to memorize those facts and also try to see ki that is it the part of the basic structure is it the part of the constitution so there are multiple judgments on that that preamble is not the part preamble is the part so on these basis that is why we are doing that prelims oriented topics only so that you will be more focused towards the prelims preparation as well so be uh, like well read about these topics that how preamble works or uh, what are the different characteristics what are there the different words in this like uh, we have done that sovereign socialist secular democratic republic if we are writing it here and in the previous year question uh, prelims as well uh, they uh, were asking about that is socialist written in the uh, preamble so that is why you should be more focused about each and every word in the main answer as well now let's move on to the second question there is a view that absolute economic equality absolute economic equality is neither possible nor desirable it is argued that most a society can do is to try and reduce the gaps between the richest and the poor uh, member of the society do you agree so the question is saying that absolute economic equality is neither possible nor desirable what we can maximum do is to reduce the gaps between rich and poor so the uh, keyword is do you agree so if we agree we have to write it in the favor of these points so in introduction what you can do you can write the definition of the economic equality that uh, the uh, it is about the equal distribution of the wealth and the income uh, in any country or in the state where the every citizen or the every uh, everybody possess the same level of wealth and income so this is about the economic equality now the question comes about the absolute economic equality where everybody holds equal amount of the income and the wealth and opportunities so is it possible is it desirable so why it is not possible at all because there are the different individuals they have the different capabilities like they have the different skill set they have the different entrepreneurial acumen so they have the different education background they have the different health aspects so their productivity can be different so their income levels will be different so this is not also possible as well because of the different characteristics of the human being of their different capabilities skill set first point is about the different individual capabilities and second why it is not possible because of the different market dynamics because there are the different economy sectors like agriculture is there manufacturing is there then uh, tertiary level then second uh, quaternary quinary so all the different level have the different earnings and the people involved in that they have the different earnings they have the different uh, like uh, income level and also there are the different market dynamics like uh, if any thing which is in the demand obviously people will pay more for it and that rates will be uh, different their income levels will be different so the market perspectives or the market dynamics is also the reason that why absolute economic equality is not possible first thing then second is why it is not desirable if everybody possess the different amount of income different same wealth same opportunities same income level so where are the incentives whosoever is doing the best of the whatever the efforts they are putting in so equal or the equality in the income disincentivize the best people so this stifles the innovation entrepreneurship and the overall economic growth so this is why it is not desirable as well next coming to the point that now what we can do 
शैल वी लीव इट दिस मच इकोनॉमिक डिस्पैरिटी नो वी कैन ट्राई टू रिड्यूस द गैप्स बिटवीन द रिच एंड पुअर वी कैन ट्राई टू एड्रेस द इन इक्वालिटीज वी कैन ट्राई टू प्रोवाइड द फेयर एंड द जस्ट टू एवरीबडी जस्ट डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ द सर्विसेज ऑफ द गुड्स एट्सेट्रा सो यू कैन ऑल्सो राइट अबाउट दैट द इन इक्वालिटीज इन द सोसाइटी क्रिएट्स द सोशल अनरेस्ट विच हैम्पर्स द इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ सो वी शुड ट्राई टू एड्रेस दिस and by addressing the inequalities it promotes the social cohesion when the people will uh, act with the fraternity brotherhood like they do not have the hatred to uh, amongst the poor earning people and hatred towards the higher earning ones so there will be the higher social cohesion now there will be the increased opportunities access to the people so now uh, there will be the equitable distribution of the benefits to all the sections of the society and how we can do that this we can achieve it by the policy or the governmental interventions like there are the progressive uh, uh, taxation system is there welfare schemes uh, benefits to the health and the education so this is how we can reduce or we can try to address the disparities so this is the whole question the understanding of the whole question and we have written this much only in both the parts so finally coming to the conclusion so what we should do finally we should strike a balance we should also promote economic growth how by encouraging individual initiatives it means we are not trying to get the absolute economic equality and stifling the uh, individual capabilities and we should promote the economic growth via encouraging individual initiatives also at the same time try to address reducing the disparities or so that the benefits will reach to all the segments of society so this is how you can write the conclusion let's see the model answer writing about something about the economic equality reasons why this economic absolute economic equality is not possible why this is not desirable what we can do maximum is to strike a balance or reduces or addressing the gaps the disparities so this is how we can write the second question let's move on to the third question anti defection law is defeating the purpose of what it was meant to achieve critically analyze so how we can write this particular question we can tell something about anti defection law very short you can make some box tell about the provisions or even you can ignore this part then the purpose of anti defection then how, what are the challenges with that so this will cater to the demand of the question about how it is defeating the very purpose of what it was meant to achieve so we'll write some challenges and finally what we can do with respect to the recommendations or the suggestion by second arc and the supreme court or other uh, recommendations towards the end so this is the question so in introduction what you can write that anti defection law was enacted in 1985 through this 52nd constitutional amendment act uh, it came into force to discourage or prevent the defections by imposing penalties on the party members who were switching the parties and not obliging uh, towards a party discipline or who were violating the party discipline so this way you can start the introduction then comes to the body part that what are the various provisions of the anti defection law so this is just for your revision purpose also like for the prelims as well as mains this holds very important part as well that what are the key provisions like there are the dis uh, qualification conditions are over uh, written over there the very first is about a person is disqualified when he voluntarily uh, give up his membership so the, that person will be disqualified second is about if he votes against the party whip or if he abstains from voting whatever the party whip is saying so that will also lead to the disqualification of that member next is about what are the disqualification related to the independent member 
if the independent member will join the party after getting elected that will be declared as a disqualified member then nominated member if the nominated member joins any party after the expiry of the 6 months of getting elected then he will be uh, disqualified from the from being the member of the house but certainly there are certain exceptions that person is not declared as disqualified when he do something uh, does something so when there is a merger and the party members in that merger and they are merging to the different Uh, political party they will not be declared as a disqualification so earlier it was one third member if there is one party and if the one third of the member is merging with the other party that is not said to be disqualification but after the later amendment it got to the two third then so this will not be the disqualification next is about the exception related to the presiding officer let's take an example of speaker or the chairman these are the presiding officers so after being getting elected to the chair of the house if they uh, give up their membership from that particular political party and after being ceasing to hold the office like when their membership is expired or they are not uh, the speaker or the chairman of that particular house if they again rejoin their political party that will not lead to the disqualification of the uh, elected member or the presiding officer this is also the exemption and next the provision is related to the authority for declaring the disqualification for that particular member this is with the speaker of the house and his judgment is full and final and cannot be challenged in any particular court of law so these are some basic provisions for the entity defection next comes about the purpose of the entity defection why at the first place this entity defection law came into the force so first is about to make the stability of the government like if any particular members they are switching like uh, as we have seen in the case of iram gayaram if they switch from one party to another party that leads to the step uh, down of the government like as we have seen in 1999 atal bihari vajpayee government they just need uh, had to step down of the government just by lacking of one vote so this was the best example that even if the one person is not there they uh, these cannot form the government with the majority government or the coalition government whatever the case may be so nt uh, so the defection leads to the instability in the government next comes about the prevention of the horse trading what is horse trading the selling and the buying of the legislator just for the financial gains they were doing that so nt defection tries to prevent this horse trading and you can also quote some example like operation kamal or operation lotus was there where one party member tries to poach the party members of the other party just to make their government in like earlier it was in the karnataka state then delhi also it happened so it uh, one major government tries to poach the political party member so that they can form in the majority next comes about the promotion of the party discipline why this entity defection promotes the party discipline because this disqualification also applies to those who violate the party rules or the party whip decisions so it also tries to promote the party discipline next is about the preservation of the mandate like whosoever came to the came as a elected representative they have come up after getting votes from the people in the name of their party as well so the people have trust on them but if they are just switching from one party to another they are uh, violating the trust of the people next comes enhancement of the accountability again it is the same way that they should be held accountable to the people and they should be responsible for their acts as well so this is why entity defection law tries to achieve these objectives next comes about the what are the challenges or the issues with the entity defection law like first is entity defection leads to disqualification like we have read certain provision so what it is saying that it tries to curb the dissent also like if some legislator they do not stand their voice 
just in the accordance of their party leaders whatever the party is saying and they want to hold their conscience as well but they cannot do that this may result into their disqualification so this results into curbing their dissent and undermining the representative democracy next comes about the lack of intra party democracy like they have to oblige to the party whip it means the party whip can dominate the members of the political party otherwise they will uh, the party members have the fear of getting disqualified next is fragmentation of the party if due to this uh, anti defection what people are doing what legislators are doing they are like merging is the exception for this disqualification so what they are doing either they are separating from the one party and joining some small parties or they are forming their different parties so this results into the fragmentation of the parties next is about the challenge is related to the speaker's role about their judgment that is full and final and cannot be challenged so this uh, results into the like biases also the speaker can have so it results into the fear that the speaker biases can result into someone's disqualification as well then there are some suggestions for the reform like second arc what it tells that uh, this disqualification final judgment should not be on speaker but on the president or the governance governor after consulting the election commission of india and supreme court has also suggested that parliament should set up an independent tribunal headed by the retired judge of the higher judiciary to decide the defection cases it means this is also suggesting to take away the speaker's role from this disqualification decision next is about raising the threshold for disqualification then allowing independents to join the parties so these are some suggestions for reform finally what we can conclude we need to strike a balance so that the dissent should not be uh, curbed and also the party and the representative uh, representative democracy should also be promoted so we need to strike a balance so that is why we need to make some reforms and finally what you can conclude you can write about kyoto holohan versus zajilu and other this is a very prominent judgment with respect to the anti defection law and it affirmed the constitutional validity of this anti defection law that yes this is valid this is not unconstitutional and it also upheld the speaker's role in the disqualification of the mps and the mls and it also emphasized the party discipline for the robust democracy we cannot ignore that so this is how we can write the conclusion let's move on to the model answer starting with the basic definition or just the description of the uh, anti defection then provisions then purpose then what are the issues behind that and some suggestions and finally kyoto holohan case and how it uh, makes the robust and the accountable democratic framework in the country so this is it from my side for today thank you and have a nice day and keep learning and keep writing thank you